hello, everybody. Um, so like Neil said, I'm Abby Fickner. Um, a lot of people know me as Hacker Chick because I do the Hacker Chick blog on how to develop better software and better startups. And I'm hacker in residence here at the iLab. Um, as a developer, you could say product development is pretty much my specialty. And in getting to work with hundreds of early stage startups, a lot of times um, I see them struggling with trying to figure out what the right product is to build for their startup. Um, there's a lot of talk and theory about minimum viable product, and I love this concept in theory, but in practice, sometimes it's a little confusing. How am I going to build something that's really super minimal and still compelling enough that people actually want to use my product? Um, on the other side of the spectrum, I also talk to a lot of startups who are like, you know, startups are kind of in a race. We're trying to go really fast. And I don't want to mess with minimum viable product. I already know exactly the right product to build, so I don't want to mess with any of that. Um, but what they don't want to do is be the startup who goes off and builds this fabulous product, uses up all of their money and time and resources to do it, and turns out that nobody wants it, right? Because now they have no resources left, and they've got a fabulous product that nobody actually wants. So I don't want you guys to be in that position. So I want to talk about what we can do differently. So at the last Lean Startups uh, conference, Justin Wilcox, who is the founder of Balance, got up on stage before the hundreds, thousands of entrepreneurs, and he said, your startup isn't a business. It's a hobby. I can see why you might get the two of them confused. There's a lot of similarities. They're both way more fun than having a real job. They're both easy to obsess over, and they both cost a shit ton of money, especially considering the opportunity cost, right? But here's the thing. With a business, you actually make more money than you take, give out. And so I want to talk to you guys about discovering the right product for your business. So they say that the dream team for a startup is a hacker, a hustler, and a hipster. A hacker who's going to build a product, a hustler who's going to bring in the business, and a hipster who's going to make it an amazing experience. So I want to get a feel for who's in the room today. So who are the hackers that are here today? OK, some of them. We need more hackers out there. <laughs> um, who are the hustlers that are in the room today? OK, awesome. And then who are the hipsters? Oh, good. Wow. I think this is the first that I see more hipsters than hackers. That's a good thing. Usually, we're really short on them. And um, I'm guessing a lot of you guys are here because you have an idea. Um, we're going to mic this because, of course, Neil took my mic. Um, because we're videoing this, is anybody willing to share their idea? Just give like a 30 second elevator pitch on what your idea is. Somebody. I'm just going. Um, I'm Laura, and I'm working on a startup here at the iLab making food out of insects. So, insects are a lot more environmentally sustainable than other sources of meat, and they taste good. And we're actually trying to figure out what insect food product to bring to market to convince people that they should be eating insects. So that's why I'm here. Love it. You will be the first startup that I've helped with, with eating bugs. <laughs> do, we have, do we have another? Hi. My name is Maki. I'm working for a company called Gelly. It's uh, creating a new distribution model for African-inspired fashion in the US. So working closely with the designers based in the US primarily to create a new distribution model for African inspired fashion. Thank you, love it. And can we get one more? One more brave soul. I know people have ideas, that's why you're here. Let me try. Is this better, is this on? We're not gonna get a third, really? Okay, oh, here we go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Hansen. I'm working on Cubicle Candy. It's interior design for cubes. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. OK, so um, these were terrific. I noticed one thing, and that might be happening here too. A lot of times when I ask people for their startup ideas, they get a little overwhelmed because they feel a lot of pressure to come up with something that sounds really sexy, right? But that really isn't what this is about. Um, contrary to what it might look like on TechCrunch, startups are really not a popularity contest. Um, so a few months back, Paul Graham wrote this great article on how to get startup ideas. And what he said is the way to think up startup ideas is not to try to think of startup ideas. The way to get great startup ideas is to look for problems. And ideally, problems that you yourself have, because then you really understand them. 
And so I actually want you all to take a shot at this. So you've all got 3 by 5 cards and some pens in the middle of the table. I want you all to take one of 3 by 5 cards, and on the front of it, I want you to write down your best idea. It doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be sexy, just the best idea you have right now. And you've got one minute. Okay, now what I want you to do is take that 3x5 card, I want you to flip it over to the back, and on the back of it, I want you to write down your worst startup idea. What's the worst idea you can think of for starting <laughs> business? Okay, does everyone have their worst startup idea? All right, now what I want you to do, since you're sitting conveniently at these nice little tables, is I want you to get into groups of about three, so join up with like two other people at your table, and I want you to vote on which is the worst, worst startup idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say a couple things and see if they come through, because now's a good time. <laughs> you know how that sound? Is that any better? Is that better? Nobody holds it up that high. How about like this? Okay, all right, does everyone have their worst idea? So I want you guys, so I want you guys to hold on to those. We're going to come back to them. A lot of times when I talk to people who are doing tech startups, they are really focused on the product. And so they tend to be thinking about things in this order. Can I build it? Assuming that I can build it. Can I get people to know about it? Assuming that I can, can I actually make money from it? So this is actually probably the opposite way that you want to be thinking about it. So before you go drop out of school or quit your job or whatever, you probably want to first be asking yourself, is this an idea that I can make money from? Is this going to be a business or a hobby? And then that should be very closely followed by, can I get people to know about it? So how am I going to actually acquire these customers and pull them away from whatever it is that they're currently using? And only then can you start thinking about, can I build it? Because to even figure out what it is, you need to really understand who those customers are and what you're doing that's going to be so compelling for them that they're going to be willing to take a risk on using your new product. So, um, so that's a little bit vague and abstract to think about. So I tried to put it into a step one, step two, step three here. So the things that we want to be thinking about, the kind of key things when we're thinking about what the right product to build is, is we want to find a problem that's worth solving. We want to really understand the customer that we're solving it for. We want to find a solution that's going to deeply resonate with them. And then we want to launch, not when we have like the biggest, best product that has every feature in the world, but when we have what Paul Graham likes to call a quantum of utility, which is Enough that you're sufficiently better than some of the options out there and that some people are going to be really excited about. So I put them in a nice step one, step two, step three, but the reality is that the entire process is very messy. Thank you. <laughs> the entire process is very iterative um, or messy, whatever you want to call it. We're not really doing these in a nice, neat order. We're doing them sort of all at the same time and jumbled together. But for the sake of not making this presentation be all jumbled together, I'm going to try to walk through them in order. Cool. OK, so the biggest problem that I see startups doing is that they fail to do step number one, which is to find a problem worth solving. And that typically manifests itself something like this. We have this great idea for this awesome new product. We went off and we built it. We put it on our website. And not a single person clicked through to it. So what did we learn from that? Anybody? Did we learn anything from that? We probably didn't learn very much from that, right? So the question is, was there a faster way to learn that? So we could have just put the link on our website, and when people clicked through to it, said, oops, sorry, it's not available yet. If we had some analytics to show us the count of zero that clicked through, we would have learned just as much without having to actually build the product, right? And so a perfectly viable tactic for just understanding if there's a need for your product or not is to build something called a landing page. Just put a page up there, see if people are even interested in it enough to sign up. So this gets to starting before we build it, asking, can I actually make money from it? And what can I do to validate that? A really great example that I like of this is Buffer. Has anyone ever used or heard of Buffer? 
So Buffer is this really great social media app. Um, it lets you basically create this buffer of all the stuff that you want to share with your friends. And instead of spamming them all at once, it'll kind of queue it up and send it out for you. So easily add great articles, pictures, and videos to your buffer, and we'll automatically share them for you throughout the day to your social media feeds. So this is great. This is what it looks like today. This is not how it looked when it started. So initially, they had this idea, but they weren't sure if anyone wanted to use it or not, so they wanted to validate that first. So all they did is they created this very simple page that explained what they thought was going to be the first version of Buffer. Choose times to tweet, add tweets to your Buffer, Buffer does the rest. Relax. Just sit back. It's going to handle it for you. So all they did was they tweeted this out. People came to the site. They'd see the simple description. If they liked it, they'd click plans and pricing, and they'd be get basically an oops, you caught us before we're ready. But if you're interested, give us your email address. They tweeted it out, people came, some of them gave their email addresses. Wasn't a billion people, but they didn't really need a billion people. They just wanted an indication, are people interested or not? They seem to be interested. So does anyone want to take a guess at what the next step they did from here was? You guys are going to have to be more interactive because it's a very interactive session. <laughs> yeah. A survey. A survey. OK, they could do a survey to understand more about the customer. OK, anybody else? They tried other positioning. Tried other positioning? Like on their website and saw click throughs for that. To see if they got more response from other positioning? Yep. Yeah. They emailed the people they thought. They could email the people again to get more information. These are all good ideas. Did I see another hand over here? Yeah. They maybe found out how much they would be willing to pay for it? Found out how much they would be willing to pay for it. So I like this guy's idea because we're trying to figure out these are all good. You want to talk to the customers, absolutely. But what we really, what it comes down to, is we want to learn if we can actually make money off of it. So all that they did was they added one little page in between that was plans and pricing. And so everything else was the same. When they clicked plans and pricing, they'd get three options. One was pay free, and then two were paid. They kept tweeting it out. People kept coming to their site. Most of them clicked the free plan, but some of them clicked the paid plan. And they were like, you know what? That's enough for us. Because their first version of the product was so simple, they thought they could get it out there in a day or two. So you don't want to spend weeks validating the idea for if it's worth to spend a day or two building it, right? In the end, software's hard, so it took them a week. But regardless, in one week, they got the first version of Buffer up. They very shortly after had 500 users and were bringing in revenue. So they're two weeks old. They have a product, they have users, and they have revenue right out of the gate. Pretty awesome, right? So if doing a landing page to validate that people are willing to pay for your product before you build it is good, what's even better is if you can actually get them to pay before you build it. Um, so are you guys familiar with Pebble? Pebble is one of these cool new smartwatches. It's Eat Paper Watch. It talks to your smartphone. It can do all these apps on it. So like if you're cycling, it can do a cycling computer. If you're listening to music, it can control Sonos or whatever. Um, the problem with hardware is it's hard, and they're probably not going to get their first version out in a week, right? <laughs> and it costs a lot of money. So they said, you know, we want to actually see if people are willing to pay before we build it. So they set up a Kickstarter. They basically used it as a pre-order system. And they set, up, they set up a goal. They said, if we can get $100,000 in pre-orders, then it's worth it to us, and we'll go forward with this. If we can't, nobody pays anything, and all is good. So they put it up there. Not only did they hit their goal of $100,000, but they actually hit 10, over $10 million and became one of the largest Kickstarters ever. Um, what I love about this, I don't know if you can quite see, but it doesn't even quite fit into the, the UI. The number is so big that they raised. <laughs> um, so this, again, was really awesome. Right out of the gate, they have $10 million in revenue. So something to just think about when you're thinking about things like landing pages and um, Kickstarters. These are really great tools. Never underestimate the value of video. You saw Pebble had a video. Probably one of the most famous examples of someone who did this is Dropbox. People have probably heard of the three-minute video that they put up. Just really like not even high-quality three-minute screencast that Drew Houston, the founder, put up showing what Dropbox looks like. Put it up on Hacker News, and overnight he went from 5,000 signups to 75,000 signups. So it's really great to think about, OK, here are some tools that we can use to validate if people are going to be interested in our product, if they're going to give us money or not. But when we look at some of these numbers, so like 75,000 signups overnight, $10 million that Pebble raised from 69,000 backers, which I don't know what the math was, but if you assume that even 1 in 10 of the people who showed up pledged, then that's 690,000 people they drove to their site, right? And then the question you have to start asking yourself is, how do you actually get people to your site 
so you can even validate if they're interested or not. Which brings us to step number two, which could very easily be step number one, which is to know your customer. So I think what this really gets to is understanding what is the vision of what we're trying to do with our startup. And this is a place that startups are really different than big companies, right? Because at big companies, we already have an existing product. We have customers that we can go out and talk to and say, what do you want? Um, this always kind of reminds me of the Henry Ford quote that I'm guessing you guys have all heard, which is if Henry Ford had asked his customers what they wanted, they would have said, a faster horse, yes. And so if we fast forward 100 years or so to today's automobiles, this is Travis Kalanick. He's the founder of Uber. And Uber um, is kind of disrupting taxis, sort of like Ford disrupted the horse, I guess you could say. And Uber stemmed from the founder's frustrations with taxis. So they saw that there was a problem with taxis. So they did step number one. They found a problem worth solving. But if Travis Kalanick had just gone out and asked people what they wanted, you might envision something very different than what Uber is today. So if you imagine him kind of walking the streets of Boston and asking people what they wanted from cabs, I'm guessing, A, they would have said, I want to find a cab at 2 AM when the T's closed and everyone's getting kicked out of clubs and bars, right? And for any of you who've actually ridden in a cab in Boston, you might say, I'd like to be able to find one of those rare Boston cabbies who's not a completely insane driver so I can increase my odds of getting home alive, maybe. <laughs> so you might envision a mobile app which, with a map, and you can see icons where all the cabs are, maybe like a sanity to insanity rating above their head. <laughs> and that could be useful, maybe. But the question is, would it have earned Uber the $3.5 billion valuation they just got last month? And I'm guessing not. And the reason is because Kalanick, like Ford, had a much grander vision of what could be. And so when you're thinking about your vision, I don't want you to get caught up with what my product can look like today. I want you to be thinking about how things can be different and therefore better. And then when you take that to what your product looks like, I want you to start from this big vision of how you want things to be different and better and identify where that intersects with what reality can accommodate today. Because this slice is where your product is gonna be that's gonna be successful today. So you're not gonna wanna be building this whole thing from the get-go. That is not a good idea. You'll probably just fall on your face if you try to build everything. But you want to be building the small slice that's still part of this much grander vision, and that's how you're getting people really excited about what you're doing. So when we're looking at startups and we're trying to figure out which ones are going to make it big and which ones aren't, there's usually three dimensions that people consider and really look at for whether the startup's going to kill it or not, right? One is team, so who's on the startup? One's market, one's product. So I'm just curious what you guys think. Who thinks um, that when you're looking at a startup, if they're going to be successful or not, that team is most important? OK, a good amount of people, actually. Market? All right. And product? OK, so most of the people team, and then market, and then product. So I think I would often say team as well. Um, I think I could probably make a good argument for any of these three. But I think Mark Andreessen makes a really compelling argument for market and why market trumps all is what's most important. Because what he says is that in a great market, you can have, in a great market, people are so desperate for a solution that you can have a product that isn't very good in a team that's making all sorts of mistakes and you're still gonna be okay, right? But in a terrible market, you can have the best product in the world and you can have an amazing team and you're gonna fail. And so the most important thing is to understand who your customer is and really understand what it is that they're looking for. So I think someone that's a startup that's done a really good job with this is Pinterest. Um, it's kind of funny because we look at Pinterest and we think of them as like they launched and boom, had this overnight success. But as is often the case, it wasn't quite that smooth. Uh, Pinterest launched, they were out for a few months and they had like 3,000 users. Not great for a social network. Um, but worse was those 3,000 users weren't actually using the product. So what happened was the team had this really great network. Um, their founder, Ben Silberman, I think had been in YC, and they were just really well connected. So they were able to reach out to their friends, and their friends reached out to their friends, able to very quickly get 3,000 users. But these were people like them, right? They were probably techies and entrepreneurs who lived in major startup cities who were probably guys in their 20s or something, probably not the target market for Pinterest, right? 
not sure what the target market for Pinterest is, but I'm guessing it's more like moms in the Midwest. And that was not. <laughs> so they said, okay, how do we find our market? They didn't even know how to find these people. Um, and so what they did I thought was really clever is they started these meetups called Pin It Forward. So these were in-person meetups, crazy idea, no like online things. In-person meetups, they'd bring people in, they did these, I don't know, these vision boards where people would post up their images and their collages that inspired them. And what they said was, not very many people came. But the people who came loved it. And so they started using the app and they were so excited about it, they started telling their friends. And now three years later, they've gone from 3,000 users to 70 million. So the takeaway from this, and what you, I want you to really think about when you're thinking about what your initial startup is, is that you want to be thinking about those 10 users who love you, right? It is way better to have 10 users who love what you're doing than 100 users who are meh, or even 3,000. Because if they're not using your product, then you're going to fail. So it's very counterintuitive. but. When you first get out there, when you're first thinking about what's my product, who's the market that I'm going after, you want to start small. You want to go super niche because the smaller the market that you go, the more niche that you go, the more you can really precisely pinpoint who these people are, the more you can understand like, what problems do they have, or what solution is going to resonate with them. These are the people that you can come up with a product that can be really minimal and yet still compelling to them. And so your goal when you first get out there should not be to go really big. Your goal should be to go small and dominate a very small market so you get your name out there and then you can build upon that success. And there's great examples of this but we never think about it, right? So obviously right here at Harvard, Facebook, they started Harvard only, 20,000 users. That's not a big market. Bill Gates started with the basic compiler for the Altair. I don't know but I can't imagine there was more than a few thousand Altairs out there. So I kind of phrase this, first think about your problem, then think about your customer. But I think the reality is that when you're thinking about what's my product, who am I going after, you really want to be thinking about both of these at the same time. And that should be your foundation from which you start. So um, I'll pick on something that not many people are doing anymore. But a couple years ago, like everybody was doing recipe apps. Does people remember that? Like everyone you talked to was like, I'm doing a recipe app. I'm like, OK. So I'd ask them. I'd say, OK, well, who's your customer? And they'd say, Anyone who cooks? And I'd say, anyone who cooks? And they'd say, yeah, I want to get as many users as possible. I'd be like, OK, well, I guess I can't argue with that logic. Um, what problem are you going to solve for them? And they'd say, I'm going to help them find recipes. So let me just ask you guys, how many people in here cook? OK, and how many of you can't find recipes? <laughs> so there's something called Google you should try. It's really awesome. <laughs> good ones. Okay, good ones, yes. But then if you want good ones, then you're probably going after people who are more specific, more niche, right? Um, so trying to just help anybody in the world who, even, who cooks even macaroni and cheese in the microwave, right, find recipes is just not compelling. Um, I kind of liken this to the people who get out there and they want everybody to like them, and so the result is that they're just kind of boring, right? So you don't want to be that person, and you don't want your startup to be that company. So instead, I feel like you can approach this from a couple different angles. If I start on the customer side, I might say, OK, who am I really passionate about? Who are my people? Right? There might be people. There's probably, if I'm interested in being in the recipe space or the cooking space, it's probably because there's a certain type of people that I'm really excited about helping. So maybe they are amateur gourmet chefs. They're people who really love to cook. It's not their job, but they do it for fun. Awesome. Then what's a problem that I can help them with? Well, maybe they just want to make fabulous food for their friends and family. Is that a problem for them? I don't know, but now at least I've got people and I've got a problem that I can go out and talk to them about, right? The other s approach that I can take is what's a problem worth solving? Um, if I think about food and I think about problems, I think about we're always hearing about this obesity demic and everybody wants to lose weight, everybody's on a diet, so the problem is that we need to lose weight, right? Great. So who's the customer that I want to target there? I can say dieters, but if everybody's trying to lose weight, then that's kind of like saying anyone who cooks. That isn't very interesting. So since we're at Harvard, I'll say dieters who are in college. And as soon as I do that, I can get so much more interesting, just like with the recipes, right? Because now, instead of just being one more diet app, there's already like a billion out there, I can say, what are the specific problems that 
students have at college who are trying to lose weight. And maybe they're stuck eating in the dining halls, right, which is like really limited in food. And so I can address that. And maybe their school schedules are really tough. And so how can they find time to work out at gyms? So maybe I can do things like compile databases with calorie information specific to their dining halls or find exercise options on campus and in the surrounding city. And now this is much more interesting and much more compelling to that market. So I want you guys to give it a try now. Um, so get back in your teams. And I'd like you, for your worst idea, to figure out what problem you're solving and who you're solving it for. And I'll give you a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, does everybody have their problem and their customer? All right. So hold on to those because we're going to build upon that. So now that we know who our customer is, or at least we think we know who our customer is, and we think we know what problem we're solving for them, the next thing to do is to actually go out and talk to them. And the thing that I like best for understanding a problem that someone has is to tell a story. Probably not a story of how to conceive a child, because that would be awkward, but a story about what you think the problem is that you're solving for them. So if we go back to the dieters in college, you might tell them about Kate, who is an undergrad here at college. She gained some weight in her first year, and she wants to lose it. And she knows how many calories she should eat, but she's stuck to dining hall food. She has no idea how many calories it is, and it's frustrating, right? And so she's not losing any weight, and she's frustrated. So if I go out and I tell this to someone who's totally not on a diet or not a college undergrad eating at dining halls, then that's not going to work. They're just going to be like, whatever, words, right? I'm not even listening to you. So you want to make sure when you go off and you talk to people, they're definitely the people in your target market. And then if they really have this problem that you're talking about, even if you have some details wrong, something is probably going to click. Because as humans, we relate to stories, right? And so when you tell a story, you want to ask, does this resonate with you? And they'll say yes, or maybe they say no, and you can say, OK, well, does it remind you of anything? And if you're in the right ballpark, then chances are it does. And then get them to tell you the story in their own words. And so as you go and you talk to several people in your customer segment, then you keep tweaking the story over time to the point where it's really using the word, your customer's words and things that really resonate with them about this is the story. So they're all to the eventually nodding their heads that, yes, this is my problem. This really resonates with me. This is a really big problem. I'd love you to fix it. So you work on the problem. And then the next thing that you do when you're talking to them is you say, OK, given that general problem, what are kind of the top three problems within that? So maybe it's that I want to lose weight. I want to, I'm frustrated that I don't know the calories at the dining halls. And I'm, I don't know, tempted by the junk food at the dining halls, right? Get them to tell you what their three problems are, because they might be very different than what you think they are. And get them to prioritize them, because that's going to help you when you build your product to figure out what the right order is. And then, where I want you to spend the majority of your interview, this is the most important part, is to have them walk through each of these three problems and talk about what they're doing to solve them today. And this is going to do two things for you. One is, if they say, yes, this is a really big problem, and you say, OK, what are you doing to solve it today? And they say, well, nothing then it's not really a big problem, right? Because if they're not doing anything today to solve it, what's going to make them start using this app of yours that they've never even heard of suddenly to solve it? It's pretty unlikely. So that's kind of a criteria to understand if it's really a problem or not. But then if they are doing something, now you know what they're doing to solve it. And so you know what your product needs to be better than. So I want you to go back into your teams and I want you to do two things. One is I want you to figure out what your customer interview story is. And that's like a little bit vague. So the three things you want to be thinking there are who's the persona? So who's your Kate, the undergrad in college? Um, what's the problem scenario that she wants to lose weight? And what isn't working that she doesn't know the calorie count in dining halls? So think about those three things and kind of put it into a story. And then think about what you think are the top three problems that your customers are having here. If we do get to the point where we're like, what am I going to do during the day if I do this as well? Like, oh, well, there's plenty of people who want to film. Okay, um, it sounds like people are wrapping up. Does anybody need another minute? You guys are good. Okay, awesome. So, 
Hold on to these. But hopefully what you can see now is we're starting to hone in on understanding um, who our customer is that we're going to be able to figure out what the right product for them is. So the great thing about when you get to this point is you not only know who your customer is, which means you know how to reach them, um, but you know what messaging is going to resonate with them because you've gone out and talked to them. And so when you do have your product and you're ready to reach out to them, you know how to find them, you know how to get them to come to you. So now we can start thinking about, OK, what is the right solution for them, which is step number three, to find a solution that's going to resonate with these people. So an approach that I really like is called concierge service. Sometimes people call it Wizard of Oz for a man behind the curtain. Um, and the idea is, instead of saying, OK, what can I automate for these people by building a product? The question is, what can I actually manually do for these people to see if this is the right solution for them or not? So a really great example of this um, is Aardvark, which does social search. I don't know if you guys have heard of this before. Um, but the idea is that there's some questions that you really need to ask a person, not a search engine. So I don't know, like what's the coolest, or like the weirdest iLab startup, right? Is probably six foods, right? <laughs> the bug eating, right? But you might not get that off of a search engine. You might want to ask an expert. So um, how do you build this? I don't know, but you know what? I actually don't have to worry about that initially. I just want to see if anybody's actually interested in it. So Aardvark put up this website. There was really no tech behind it. When somebody would fill out, would ask a question, what's the coolest, weirdest startup at iLab? An email would go to the founder. The founder would go find an expert, which is maybe like a resident at iLab who can know about the iLab teams. And they'd say, six foods, definitely. They're feeding people bugs. It's kind of weird and cool at the same time. <laughs> right? Send it back to the founder, who'd then email the person who asked. So once you get to the point where there's enough traffic coming to the site where you're like, hey, this is an actual business idea, then you validated your idea. And now you can go off and build it. It scares me to death a little bit as a software developer because I think, oh my god, once you get to the point where you need to scale, like you need to be able to flip it on the next day and you haven't started building it yet. Um, but the truth is, Aardvark actually took a year to build this out. Um, I don't know all the details, but I can imagine they did it very iteratively, kind of addressing the most uh, manually intensive parts first. And Google wound up acquiring them for $50 million. So it sounds ghetto, but it works. Something else that I really like a lot um, is called a concierge test. Um, I think this slide is kind of creepy, sorry. I couldn't figure out what a concierge <laughs> test should look like. Um, but the idea is to actually just sit down with people. So I'll keep going back to my bad college diet example. But uh, if I think that what I want to do is provide personalized meal plans for college dieters that are based on what's available in their dining hall, I might actually go up to people who are my potential customers, people in my market, and say, will you pay me to sit down with you and give you a personalized meal plan? I'll be your nutritionist. And the idea is that if they're not willing to pay me to do this in a highly customized fashion, like I'm going to sit down with you, walk you through it, we'll go to the dining halls together, you can tell me what you like, what you don't like. If they're not willing to pay for that, what are the chances that they're willing to pay for this very uncustomized app that's going to be developed, right? And the thing that I really love about this most is that it gives you an opportunity to sit down with your potential customers and really understand what's going to work and what isn't. So you can walk through the dining halls with them, and things can come up that you hadn't even considered, right? They can say, well, I'm allergic to this. OK, I need to think of allergies. And this is, I don't know, my favorite food, so I want to get it in there. And I like this format, and I don't like this format. And this works, and it doesn't. You don't get that. If you just try to go build the product, then you have to wait until they've used it to get that feedback. If you can do something on manually with them and kind of figure out what that should look like in conjunction with them. It gives you a, such a clearer picture of what's going to work so that when you do go to build your product, it makes so much more sense. Like I know exactly what questions I need to be asking about allergies. I know exactly what the format should be looking like. So, um, so I've talked about these first three steps, finding a problem, knowing your customer, and finding a solution that resonates in sequence as if they just happen very neatly, one and then the next. And then boom, you know what you want to build. Um, of course, startups aren't like that, right? You're doing it. You think you know what the problem is until you talk to customers. And then you realize that's wrong. And then you realize your customer segment was wrong. So you want some different one who has a different problem. Then you think you understand that, come up with a solution. And they're like, no, we don't actually care about that solution. We don't like it. So you're constantly iterating on these things. And so when I think about a startup, I think about a startup as sort of the search for an alignment of these three. How can we find 
the right three of these that fit together and make sense. A lot of times this is referred to as product market fit. It's a term that Mark Andreessen came up with, um, which basically means we've identified who our customers or our market is, what product is going to resonate with them to fix the problem that they have. And what Mark says is, in a great market, a market with lots of real potential customers, the market pulls the product out of the startup. In other words, when you finally nail it, it takes you a few tries, but when you finally nail it, customers are going to be so desperate for this solution, they're going to be screaming for it, and it's going to be clear what it is that you should be building. And so now, finally, you can ask the question, am I able to build it? And the truth is, what I'm seeing with most tech startups, with most software startups at least, is the answer is absolutely yes. Because the things that we're thinking of, we're thinking of because we've seen that tech before. We know that this is going to work. And even with hardware, so many more options are becoming available that a lot of times, if we're thinking about solutions, we're thinking about things that are built with existing technology. So can I build it is not even a question. So finally, once you do build it, how do you know when to launch it? Um, and again, I'm going to say this is all very iterative. Even when you're going through those first three steps, a lot of times you're building things to put them in front of the customer and see how they react. Like Buffer built the first version of their app in one week so that they were able to see how customers actually used it. Um, but when you really feel like you know what the real product is and you want to get it out there, you don't want to wait forever. You want to be able to launch it fast. And you want to launch it when Paul Graham calls it a quantum of utility. He says, when you've built something that's sufficiently better than the options that are out there, and that at least some people are going to say, I'm really excited that you built this, because now I can finally do x. And so I'm going to put you back in your teams for one last time to take your worst idea to conclusion. Um, what I'd like you to do is, unfortunately, we're not able to go out and talk to customers, because we don't have any customers for things like glasses, windshield wipers on your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> we, okay, you could talk to me. <laughs> so you're going to have to guess what people would say, but um, think about what solution do you think is going to resonate with these customers that you came up with, and what do you think your initial product is going to be? So I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, does everybody, raise your hand if you still need a minute. We have one. Okay, I think we're going to, I think we're going to go forward then. All right, this is the fun part. So if anybody is really daring in here, is anybody willing to share their worst idea and what they came up with? I've got a mic for you, so you can be. You want to? <laughs> so you want to come up here so they can grab you? <laughs> OK, so your worst idea, who your customer is. We're not going to go into the story because that gets cut along. Uh, what problem, you, main problem you think you're solving, and what your initial product is. So we basically came up with a website for um, people who live in the United States and have illegal pets. So, in, <laughs> like, if you have a pet monkey or a pet lion or whatever you have, um, you can go on our website and um, basically, you know, the people who are harboring these pets right now, they're going on Google and they're seeing, okay, what do I feed my monkey? But our site would, be, would have specialized um, food plans and also have health benefits. Um, <laughs> You know, stuff that's really healthy for them to successfully raise their illegal pet. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Okay. And um, our customers would be all over the United States, maybe all over the world. Um, we would be able to test the site, as you suggested, beforehand to see how many people would sign up. Um, we, we prided ourselves on three um, problems. Sorry, I'm cheating. Um, Basically, our three were raising guidelines, um, finding good and healthy foods for them, and ha sort of having a, it would sort of be like a f uh, Facebook connection. Like if you go on Facebook, you can um, socialize there too. So they'll be able to socialize. Um, also, so like a Facebook for illegal pets. Owners. Owners. Right. Illegal pet owners. <laughs> okay. Um, and, um, 
And you can, um, you can also, you know, advertising would be helpful. Like, we'll have that link for pet shops that maybe sell these foods, but not necessarily. Like, if my lion likes to eat meat, <laughs> <laughs> then, um, then I can go on the website and, you know, meat companies can go on our yes. website and advertise. And I, I like it. So you have, like, you have a whole business model. You, like, went above and beyond. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, do we have any other daring souls who want to share their terrible idea and what they turned it into? All right, you guys, you're being pointed to, so I think you're being volunteered by your team. <laughs> okay. All right. um, so we created a windshield wiper for glasses, um, and our customers are college students in cold areas um, because they are very, they could want the convenience factor, they may not want to take time to clean their glasses when they're dirty. Um, so a couple of the problems that we were solving were when the glasses fogged up that you could actually, they would just clean them off for you. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about, so often people are walking around with dirty glasses, you wouldn't have to worry about kind of cleaning those off. What else am I? Oh, if, if you're with disabilities and you have difficulty um, kind of cleaning, it would make it simpler for you. You would never have to take your glasses off and actually clean them. Um, our initial product would be a piece that goes on your glasses that like swipes down and, <laughs> <laughs> and cleans your glasses. We really thought about this, so I, th I think yeah, I covered okay. all bases Like now. a squeegee? <laughs> you know what, I think it could actually be used when you're skiing, if you try to wear glasses <laughs> under goggles, yeah. right? Or when you're driving, right? right? When you're driving, I, your if you're like in a Jeep and you didn't put the top <laughs> up, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna get all wet. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. See? It, it could be. <laughs> All right. Any other takers? Can we get a third? Yeah. Can you do you want to can you come up here so we can all see you in your glory and your with your worst idea? Here, stand up here. Thank you. So our worst idea was a lemonade stand. And I guess we were thinking about our customer and we figured they'd probably be thirsty tourists. And the problem we were solving when we thought about it was, it's really a factor of convenience and not really knowing where to get the lemonade. So then we were thinking, well, how about some sort of distribution system? How, maybe GPS location-based app that allows you to order the lemonade on the go so you don't have to disrupt your experience as a tourist. I like it. So it could be almost like a task grabber or an Uber for lemonade. Exactly. Very, you should call Travis. <laughs> awesome. OK. You guys are like the shyest bunch that I've seen here. Really? Anybody else? Going once. Oh. <laughs> So we um, decided to do a social networking application for people who are albinos. And the idea, and don't, don't laugh, please, is just <laughs> that it was the worst idea initially because it was such a small sliver of the population. Um, but as we started breaking it down, uh, our customer would obviously be people who are, is a very small population, but they're looking for connection, they're looking for a sense of community. And then the problem that we're solving is, uh, we didn't want to say loneliness, but definitely like some sort of uh, affinity uh, and maybe guidance on, on other people who are, who are facing similar issues that you are. And so our initial product then was kind of like a big brother, big sister um, to, to look for, say if you were in college, to look for someone who's in the business world who's already been through the sort of experience that you've been through. Or if you're in high school, you're a 16 year old kid and, and you're kind of dealing with all the problems that a normal 16 year old does, but now you've got this added issue of the fact that you're very different. Um, and so it would offer that connection of from the older generation to the younger generation. Nice, thank you. Very cool. Okay, um, we can do one more if we have any more takers, or we can turn it over to, to questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was all that I had. I know it was a little bit torturous. I made you guys go through a worst idea. I thought about having people do it with their own ideas, but I realized different people came in with ideas, or some, every, not everyone came in with an idea. And I didn't want people forming teams where some people had like really given a lot of thought to it and then they just dominated it. So I thought this might be a fun way to do it. Um, so thank you for participating in this. That is 
all that I have. Um, so thank you.